Welcome to the Migraine Miracle Moment. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Turknett. I'm a neurologist, migraine specialist, migraine sufferer, and author of the book, The Migraine Miracle. In this podcast, you'll learn all about how to find your path to migraine freedom without pills. Let's get started. Howdy, fellow bee slayers. So today's episode is one that I know some of you have been waiting for. Um, as some of you might know, the first uh, drug in a new class of migraine medications recently hit the market. Uh, this one goes by the name Amovig. That's A-I-M-O-V-I-G. That's the brand name for the drug uh, Erunumab. And many of you have asked if I would share my thoughts about it. Um, there's been a fair amount written about it in the news lately and uh, some excitement and buzz around it. So um, folks are wondering uh, what, if any, role it should have in sort of their overall treatment plan. So in this episode, I'm going to be reviewing uh, what I consider to be the pros and cons of this new treatment. And I'll conclude with how the, I see this new drug fitting into my own approach as a neurologist um, and the type of patient I would consider it for. Uh, first, a small bit of housekeeping before we launch into the topic. Uh, we just um, started our latest Jumpstart Challenge, which means that our next 30-day challenge is going to be a uh, Keto Blast, which is our 30-day Keto Challenge. Uh, so uh, if you want to uh, learn more about that and register, uh, you can go to ketoformigraine.com. That's K-E-T-O-F-O-R-M-I-G-R-A. INE.com. Uh, and if you sign up now, you'll get the uh, early bird uh, discount. And as a reminder, uh, members of Migrant Everland uh, have unlimited access to all of our challenges, so they can participate in many in as many of the keto and jumpstart challenges as they like, uh, along with the other uh, uh, challenges that we have just for our uh, Migrant Everland members. And to learn more about Migrant Everland, go to mymigrainemiracle.com forward slash end of migraine. That's E-N-D-O-F-M-I-G-R-A-I-N-E. And remember, uh, there is a special discount code for podcast listeners. You get $30 off uh, of the uh, first six months of Migrant Everland by entering the code MOMENT, M-O-M-E-N-T, uh, when you check out. All right, so uh, on today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a new drug that just came out for migraine, which is part of a new class of drugs that are uh, being developed and that have been uh, in development for uh, over a decade now. And all of these uh, drugs target the calcit calcitonin gene-related peptide in some way, and that's abbreviated CGRP, so that's how I'll be referring to it in the rest of this episode. So there are uh, four drugs that I'm aware of that uh, ha are being developed or uh, have been developed that target uh, CGRP in some way, uh, one of which is Amovig, uh, which I believe is the correct, correct pronunciation, although I'm sure uh, there will be many different versions of that. But Amovig was just recently approved by the FDA and is now uh, out and available on the market, so you can get it. And when it received its approval, uh, there was a lot written about it in the news, uh, most of which was very favorable, uh, some of which presented it even as a possible uh, miracle drug. And this is not that unusual uh, when new drugs hit the market. Uh, you are usually going to get more eyeballs on your news story if it's uh, sensationalized a little bit. Uh, but that being said, there are some reasons uh, for celebration when it comes to this drug, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, before we dig into the topic in depth, though, I wanted to read a comment that someone made in our Facebook uh, Migraine Miracle group, which I think really frames this discussion well. So I had announced that I was going to be covering this topic and discussing my thoughts about Amovig, and this was uh, a comment made from uh, one of our members, uh, Amy. She says, Funny that this drug coming out is what finally spurred me to get on the no-drug migraine miracle path. I went to my doctor for a prescription of Amovig and got one. Sent it in. It was incorrect. Called to correct it. Waited for it in the mail. By the time it came, I had finished your book and decided not to fill the prescription. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but I've decided it is kin to firing my brain's firefighters. I'm done with any drug manipulating my brain. I no longer want the miracle pill or injection. I've found the miracle cure. 
So that was a great uh, post from uh, Amy and I think is a good uh, frame for uh, starting this conversation about uh, Amovig. So I'm going to begin uh, by just giving a little bit of background on the story of this class of drugs and uh, CGRP uh, in particular. So uh, CGRP, once again, calcitonin gene-related peptide, is, as it says, a peptide, which means it's, a, it's shorter in length than a protein. It's only 37 amino acids long. And uh, we know that there are receptors for it that are found throughout the body. Now, we've only known that it exists for a little more than 30 years, and we still don't know very much about what all it does. Like I said, we know that it's widespread. In particular, we know that there are receptors for it throughout the body, including in the central and peripheral nervous system. Um, but because it's newly discovered and because it's so widespread, uh, that means it probably does a lot, and we still don't know a lot about all those functions. We do know that it is involved in, both in um, increasing the size of blood vessels, or what's known as vasodilation, and in pain signaling during a migraine. In particular, in pain signaling within the uh, trigeminovascular system, which is what's activated uh, during uh, a migraine and is the source of much of the pain. So this molecule, the CGRP, is involved in that uh, pain signaling. And so we know that at that uh, peptide is elevated during a migraine, which was kind of the initial impetus for folks looking into this as a possible target uh, for uh, migraine relief or prevention. So since this was discovered that it was part of migraine pathophysiology, there's been a lot of effort uh, over a decade now towards trying to create a drug that targets this CGRP system uh, and signaling in some way that either leads to fewer migraines or helps relieve uh, migraines. And uh, there's been a race between several drug companies to be the first ones to bring a drug to market, which is often a, a big advantage. The first kind of drugs that were developed for this were what is known as uh, CGRP antagonists. So these are molecules that work by blocking the receptor for CGRP. So uh, the idea there is if, if uh, during a migraine uh, the CGRP is released to signal pain, if it can't bind to its receptors, then it can't uh, ultimately result in the perception of pain. So uh, blocking a receptor essentially neutralizes it. So there were trials done uh, over a decade ago uh, for using this as an abortive, the CGRP uh, antagonists. And while the results were somewhat favorable, uh, the drug resulted in liver toxicity, and so it's never, uh, never made it to market it because it didn't pass the uh, safety trials. So the next approach was to try something different, uh, either to try antibodies against the CGRP molecule itself or antibodies against the CGRP receptor. And Amovig, which, as I said, is the first in this category of CGRP acting drugs to be approved, um, and the one that recently made headlines because of this, it uh, works in this capacity. It is an antibody against the CGRP receptors. So instead of blocking the receptor, uh, Amovig is an antibody against the receptor, so the antibody will attach to it, which then provokes the immune system to destroy the receptor, just as the in immune system would uh, destroy an invading bacteria that's been tagged with an antibody. So now, uh, since the receptor, or at least some of the receptors, have been destroyed by the immune system, uh, the CGRP doesn't have anything to bind to, and so you can't generate as great of a pain signal. The other uh, CGRP drugs that are still in development are uh, antibodies to the CGRP molecule itself. So in that case, uh, you're provoking the immune system to attack the molecule rather than the receptor for the molecule, but with the hope being the end result is still the same. Now, these type of antibody approaches aren't well suited to working as an abortive. So they're not well suited to relieving an existing migraine because it takes time to work. You have to have the antibody attached, the immune system has to remo remove the uh, receptor, and so on. So this new class of drugs uh, has been investigated primarily uh, as a preventative treatment. And they are all either given subcutaneously, so under the skin by injection, or intravenously. Uh, and usually at some type of regular interval around uh, monthly. So um, given that this is a novel approach and a new target for migraines, it's generated a lot of excitement and anticipation and perhaps a bit of hype as well. So what are we as uh, migraineurs uh, to make all of all of this? Is this a miracle treatment? Should we jump on board? Should we be cautious? 
Well, to help answer that, uh, I'm going to divide up uh, the pros and cons as I see it. And I'll begin with the uh, pros, so the things that I see as uh, favorable aspects of this uh, new drug, this new class of drugs in general, and uh, Amovig in particular. So the first pro uh, is that it does seem to help. So uh, understanding whether or not, or knowing whether or not a drug uh, helps is actually a harder question to answer than you might at first think. Uh, and that's largely because the uh, placebo response is uh, significant, uh, typically in uh, migraine trials and many pain trials. And so the typical way to try to uh, eliminate the placebo response is to uh, conduct a study where you have um, half of the subjects given the actual active drug and ha half of the subjects given a uh, placebo drug, one that's uh, delivered in the same way but has no um, active ingredient in it. And usually both the uh, subjects in the trial and the um, people who are administering the trial uh, do not know who's getting the drug and who's getting a placebo. And then you look and see um, if the people getting the active drug uh, do better uh, than people getting the placebo. So the main study uh, for Amovig was published in no November of 2017 in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And one of the primary metrics that are usually used to uh, evaluate uh, a new migraine drug, uh, a new preventative, is in seeing how many uh, subjects achieve a greater than 50% reduction in migraine frequency. So if their number of migraines per unit time, usually per month, uh, goes down by uh, more than half. And so in this study, um, there are actually uh, one group of subjects that were given a 70 milligram dose of Amovig and one group that were given a 140 milligram dose. And 43% of the people who were given the 70 milligram dose had a greater than 50% reduction in their migraine frequency. And 50% who were given double that, the 140 milligram dose, uh, achieved greater than a 50% reduction in migraine frequency. So um, that sounds pretty good. However, uh, the placebo group group uh, response was 26%. So 26% of the folks in the uh, placebo group uh, achieved greater than 50% reduction in their migraine frequency. So all in all, the patients who were in this study did improve, and a little over half of that improvement was from placebo alone, and just under half of that improvement was from the drug itself, which with the uh, higher dose drug achieving a little bit more improvement than the lower dose. Now you may wonder, how does that stack up against prior preventative treatments, right? Where we know that there are several FDA-approved uh, medications on the market for migraine pre prevention. Um, one of the most recently approved is Topamax, uh, and very commonly used. So uh, in, the, in a similar trial of Topamax in 2005, where they looked at the same exact endpoint, so how many people achieve 50% reduction or more in their migraine frequency, 46% of people in that trial achieved uh, greater than 50% reduction, uh, with 23% uh, uh, doing so in the placebo arm. So the numbers from the Amovig trial and the numbers from Topamax are almost identical. Now, you do have to take any comparison like that that's not done head-to-head -head as part of the same trial with a grain of salt, but we can at least say that it looks to be in the same ballpark as the existing treatments in terms of its effectiveness. Now, I know there are probably some of you listening who may say, well, wait a second, Topamax, I took Topamax and it didn't work at all for me. Um, and th this is often a thing that happens, um, is that we see results that uh, uh, come in a clinical trial that don't match what actually happens in the real world. And there may be several reasons why that is. Um, I could speculate, but uh, I'll leave that for another day. But just taking the data on face value, um, it does appear that the effect of this drug is real and that it can lower migraine frequency to some extent in some people. Now, as the drug is used over the next several years, we will learn more about just how effective it is. Typically, when a new drug hits the market, there's often a honeymoon phase, so there's lots of good press. We get a, light, a good uh, placebo response. Everybody's excited about it. And then over time, after about a year or so, uh, that phase wears off and we get a little bit more accurate picture of what the drug uh, really does. Um, we also hope that at some point we will get some independent trials of the drug uh, that are not um, funded by the uh, company that's uh, making it. 
So usually it takes a few years after a drug hits the market for us to really understand its impact in the clinic. So the second pro uh, of Amovig is that the tolerability seems to be pretty good so far. So one of the uh, issues with the preventative medications are the side effects. So as some of you probably know, uh, Topamax, which I mentioned earlier, ha can have some unpleasant side effects, most commonly some cognitive effects where people have difficulty finding words. Uh, they might have numbness and tingling. It can predispose to kidney stones and things like that. And most of the um, migraine preventatives that are available do have side effects that are experienced by a reasonable number of people who take them, and so that limits uh, their use to some degree. And while we don't have any head-to-head -head trials that compare uh, the Amovig to, any, to the existing treatments, um, which is what you really like uh, to make these kind of comparisons, it does seem to, that it's better tolerated, at least so far, than the um, uh, other than most of the other uh, preventatives that are available. So all in all, the effectiveness seems to be at least as good as the other available pre preventatives, and it may be the fact that its side effect profile is better. Now again, we don't have a lot of information to go on. We're really talking about side effects in the short term. Um, the trial that I mentioned before uh, of uh, Amovig lasted for six months, the third pro is that uh, the drug is long-lasting. Now, this could be seen as both a, a pro and a potential con, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, but the good part about it being long-lasting is that it doesn't have to be taken every day, which typically helps with compliance. You don't have to remember to take a medicine every day. And uh, for preventative medications, if you don't take them, they're not going to do their job. You can't wait till you have a migraine uh, to take one. Um, and the reason it lasts uh, a while is because uh, it is an antibody, as I mentioned. So it's not a drug. It's not metabolized um, like a drug typically would be, uh, but rather uh, it's a, a function of how long the antibody lasts in, the, in our system. And uh, Amovig is given once a month by injection. And another benefit of uh, this being uh, a longer lasting medication is that since it is only delivered by either injection or IV as with the other uh, drugs in this class, um, that means fewer pokes with the needle. And our fourth uh, pro, which uh, I think is the most significant uh, pro of all, is that this is the first migraine specific preventative medication that has ever come out. The other drugs that are used uh, for migraine prevention and that are approved uh, were not originally developed for that. They were uh, uh, either developed as anti-seizure anti medications, uh, anti-hypertension uh, medications, or antidepressants, and then were tested for use for migraine prevention and found to be of some benefit. And that's the history of a lot of drugs, is that somebody finds or creates a, a new molecule and then they just throw it at a bunch of things to see what it might uh, help for. In this case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this began with the identification of CGRP as a, a molecule that was involved in migraine uh, pathophysiology, which then led to the search for a drug that could uh, modify its action in some way that would uh, reduce... Uh, the uh, frequency of migraines. So the fact that we've gone from that scientific observation years ago to now having a drug available that actually uh, does that. Now, this is more of a scientific achievement. Uh, in other words, this is an important milestone in uh, science and uh, in particular in migraine research, even if it's not a breakthrough in terms of uh, migraine therapy. But this is the first in a new, an entirely new class of uh, molecules that were designed specifically for uh, treatment of migraine, and it's possible that um, the, our approach will get more sophisticated and that years down the line, we'll have something that's even more effective or, or closer to a real uh, therapeutic breakthrough. All right, so those are four uh, of the most significant pros in my mind. Um, now we'll uh, discuss uh, what I kind of consider as the cons or uh, the drawbacks at this point in time. Uh, so the first uh, con uh, for uh, Amovig and any other class, uh, class, uh, drugs in this class, uh, at least initially, is that our information on them is still very limited. 
So probably the biggest negative right now is that this, that this is brand new. So we don't have all the information we like to have to make an informed decision. So things like side effects, both in the uh, short and long term, as well as any other long term risks uh, and uh, overall long term effectiveness. So as I mentioned earlier, we still don't know very much about CGRP, uh, what it does, uh, except the fact that it's widespread, um, meaning it's found throughout the body and throughout the nervous system, which means that it's likely to be important in a wide range of physiological processes. And so that means we have really no idea how to predict all of the possible consequences of blocking the receptor for this molecule. Clearly, our body is making it for a reason, and meaning it probably does some very important things. Uh, and what we're doing with this drug is blocking its ability to do so, at least to some degree. And what we're essentially doing is creating uh, an autoimmune condition on purpose. Autoimmune illnesses like uh, multiple sclerosis and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis occur when our body's immune system attacks and destroys part of itself. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is exactly how this drug works, uh, and the other drugs in this class are going to work. Um, we're essentially creating an autoimmune condition, in this case, we, where we're attacking our own receptors for CGRP or the CGRP molecule itself. Now, we're assuming at this point in time that because people who were on it in this short-term trial didn't have any major adverse reactions, that there aren't any real significant downsides to doing this. Now, to me, that would be fairly surprising if that turned out to be true. And so it's not at all unlikely that we may find certain issues or negative consequences that arise with longer-term therapy. One of the problems is when we don't have a lot of information on something, uh, we don't really understand how it works completely, uh, we don't really don't know what to look for um, in a clinical trial. I know from experience uh, being in, uh, an investigator in, some, in uh, clinical trials that it's really challenging to detect problems if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, so it's possible even that there are short-term issues associated with the drug uh, that weren't picked up in the trials simply because we didn't know what to look for. And of course, we've seen over history this sort of thing happen time and again where a drug comes out and only over time do we learn of risks and negative consequences that we didn't initially know about but that emerged several years later, um, either because they just weren't detected or in some cases because they were detected but hidden. Uh, one of the more high-profile cases of this was the drug uh, Vioxx, uh, which was approved in 1999 and quickly became one of the best-selling drugs. It's an uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drug that doesn't bother the stomach uh, like some of the others. Yet it increased the risk of heart attacks and strokes. The company Merck that uh, manufactured it hadn't disclosed uh, some of the heart attacks that had occurred. Ultimately, it was pulled from the market, uh, though there was still uh, risk that remained after taking the drug, so it didn't immediately stop after someone stopped taking it. And uh, one study concluded that there were uh, 88,000 heart attacks, uh, 38,000 of which were fatal, simply from the prescription, from the prescribing of Vioxx. And again, Part of this was because that, that hadn't been disclosed by the company that some of the heart attacks that had occurred. Again, this is a really challenging problem whenever you have billions of dollars on the line. Um, it's pretty crazy to think that you can get uh, unbiased information and um, it's just a sort of a byproduct of the system that we have. And another issue of not having all the information that we want because this is a new drug is also that the information that we do have is mainly coming from those who have a vested interest in overemphasizing the positive aspects uh, of the drug and downplaying any negative aspects. And uh, we've talked uh, in our Facebook group uh, before about the challenge of getting unbiased information about pharmaceuticals. Um, it's really difficult and a significant problem in this day and age, even for doctors, um, to get unbiased information. And um, that's largely because of the increasingly um, close relationship between the drug industry and healthcare providers, um, which wasn't always the case, but has become uh, much more significant in the past couple of decades. And so with so much money at stake, there's a lot of money changing hands uh, in an effort to try to influence uh, doctors' prescribing behaviors. 
and you'll often find that many of the most vocal advocates of a particular drug are uh, receiving money from the uh, company that makes it. And within the past decade, there was legislation passed um, that forced uh, drug companies to disclose uh, what payments have been made to doctors. And now there's even a website you can go and look up any doctor and find out how much money he or she receives um, every year from the various uh, drug companies. And uh, some people may be surprised uh, by what they find. Um, So needless to say, there are um, big-time conflicts of interest uh, which compromise our ability to get unbiased uh, information. And with a brand new drug, this is even more challenging because literally all the information we're getting on its safety and effectiveness is coming from the trials that are sponsored by the company. So all in all, there's really just not the kind of information that we'd like to have to make an informed decision at this point in time right after a drug has come out. Um, It's just not possible at this stage in the game. And that's why I generally, regardless of what drug it is, I generally don't recommend being an early adopter of a medication unless a drug has incredible benefits or is potentially life-saving. I think it's best to think of the first several years of a drug as still an experimental phase. Um, It takes at least a good five or ten years uh, for it to be used uh, in the real world in the clinic before we have a decent enough amount of information to make at least somewhat of an informed decision. Now, the uh, second con is that it's expensive. Um, What I saw is the estimated cost is about about $7,000 per year for the monthly injections. Now, compared to all the available drugs out there, especially new drugs, that's not... uh, Uh, that's not as steep as it might be. And uh, most folks who are receiving it won't be paying that entire amount out of pocket. More than likely, you'll be paying some sort of copay. um, And uh, that copay will probably be on the higher side. Uh, Most new drugs are going to be uh, a lower tier in a uh, insurance company's formulary, meaning they'll pay less of the cost uh, than ones that are Uh, on a higher tier. So there's likely to be uh, a decent expense uh, for you, the patient, uh, though you won't probably fit the entire $7,000 a year uh, bill. And there may be some assistance programs that folks may qualify for. The um, third con is that the uh, benefits of the drug, at least from the trial that has been done, are somewhat modest. Um, Like I said, they're about on par with uh, the results that came from uh, the trials of Topamax. And in a scenario like like this, where there's still a lot of uncertainty, where we don't really know uh, the long-term risks and where there's some reason to believe that there could be such a thing, we'd want the treatment to work really, really well before we accepted that risk. At least I would personally. So if every person in the trial never had another migraine again, um, then that would be, uh, you know, certainly more motivation to take on uh, the risks that come with uh, adopting a drug like this right off the bat. The fourth con is that this type of treatment kind of represents the best uh, available thing uh, within all of the constraints that our current system for finding medical therapies um, imposes. So this is an issue that almost never gets uh, discussed or talked about, but is relevant to anyone who's trying to make an informed decision in the confines of the traditional healthcare system, particularly in the U.S. and most other Western-influenced system. And that is that the treatments that are delivered, that are available inside of these systems, have to fit within all of the constraints that are imposed as part of that system. So what I mean by that is there's a huge set of hoops um, that are both formal and informal that any treatment kind of has to clear or jump through before it can be offered in a conventional medical clinic. So number one, it almost always will have to be something that can be patented so that it can be produced on a large enough scale and that somebody somebody can uh, make money from it. It also has to be testable within the confines of a randomized clinical trial like I discussed above. And that almost means some single uh, treatment uh, that can be randomized where one group gets the treatment and one group doesn't. Um, It also uh, has to be something that can be delivered or administered in a very short time frame, so within the span of a typical office visit. So right there with those criteria, um, we've essentially excluded anything in the realm of diet and lifestyle treatments, or really any type of holistic systems-based treatment. None of those treatments would be able to fit within those constraints. 
Another one is that the treatment has to be something that's going to be accepted by the typical patient. Right now, um, the typical patient, not surprisingly, comes into a clinic expecting to receive a drug treatment and aren't usually willing to make significant uh, lifestyle and behavioral changes. So all in all, this means that the reason that we have drug therapies as our main treatments isn't because they're the best available treatment. It's because that they fit within the constraints of that system and so that the available drugs are simply the, one, the best ones that fit within those constraints. So as an analogy, Imagine that you were trying to build the very best house that you could, but you only had styrofoam glue and rubber bands as your materials. So you might go through many different house designs and ways of putting those things together, and you'd certainly find certain designs and certain ways of building the house from those materials that were better than each other than, than another one. But of course, compared to a house that used all of the available materials we have for building, um, your house made of styrofoam glue and rubber bands wouldn't be nearly as uh, sturdy or as suitable for uh, inhabiting. And so the available treatments that we have inside of the medical clinic aren't there because they're the best of all possible solutions. It's just that they're the ones that, that, are, that are the best within the constraints that we've imposed from that system. But the problem is, most of us don't appreciate that in this system, we're not trying to find the very best house design, but rather we're trying to build the best house made of styrofoam, glue, and rubber bands. And this is one of the primary reasons why there's been almost no progress in the world of medical treatments over the past couple of decades, um, even as we've had incredible uh, technological advancements and transformations of our daily life in other areas, including in medical diagnostic tools. But what we've done is created a system that makes it virtually impossible to find solutions uh, that work for the conditions that we now face. And this is a big reason why, once I realized that I couldn't offer my patients the very thing that would solve the problem I was supposed to help them solve, um, I had to find another way to do so. I wanted access to all of the available tools and materials, not just a tiny little subset. And even worse was the fact that many of those treatments ultimately made uh, the, their problem worse, and especially in the case of migraines, as I've discussed. And so this is the main reason why I advocate primarily for a drug-free strategy. Not because there's anything inherently wrong with drugs, but it's because I want the thing that works the best um, because I realize how limited that approach is. And the problem with not recognizing that these drugs are the best thing we have within the constraints that we've imposed is that we st end up seeing drugs as the only tool. And if we were to break down all of the things that we could do to protect ourselves from migraines and rank them in order of their effectiveness, um, drugs, any drug, would be way down on the list. And if you consider that they also come with potential harms and side effects, uh, which drug-free approaches don't have, uh, on the contrary, they often have health-promoting effects, then you'd bump that down even further on your priority list. That being said, there are still situations where it may make sense to use them, at least in the short term, and uh, I'll discuss that uh, in just a second. The fifth con, which is somewhat individual, is that there are needles involved. Um, so for some people, uh, needles are a no-go. Uh, they won't consider any treatment that involves uh, poking. But as I said, uh, most of these are fairly infrequently delivered uh, treatments, maybe about once a month. So you get poked about uh, once a month. But most people tend to f prefer uh, swallowing a pill uh, to being poked by a needle. And the sixth and final con is that uh, this treatment doesn't address the root cause of migraines. So as I mentioned, uh, Amovig uh, and the other drugs uh, in this category target CGRP or the CGRP re receptors, which is a part of migraine physiology. So it's part of the pain signaling that happens after the migraine process has been initiated. So it's ne definitely not treating migraines at their source or at their root cause. And there are a few reasons why I consider this to be a con or a drawback. Um, one is that root cause treatments are almost always going to be the most effective. Um, and oftentimes, treatments that don't address root causes and just treat symptoms keep us from looking into or finding the root causes, and in some instances may uh, end up making the underlying condition worse. Um, this has become an even bigger problem in the last half century or so, as more and more of the conditions that we see in the healthcare clinic are systemic and multifactorial, like migraines, 
And so they're not well suited for a drug or, drug approach that can only uh, target a single thing. Um, but our sort of single-minded focus on drugs as the only real tool means uh, that all we can ever really do in these instances is reduce symptoms. And that's essentially stopped us collectively from looking towards root cause approaches. And nowadays, the typical approach to finding treatments is to kind of tr throw uh, the available uh, molecules and drugs that we have at a condition and see what works, uh, both in the uh, research lab and in the medical clinic. So take the example of type 2 diabetes. So we know that it's primarily an issue of diet and lifestyle, or at least it requires that environmental component. Yet the treatments uh, for diabetes basically allow you to engage in the very behaviors that brought the condition on in the first place. Many people can get their sugar under reasonably con good control with a pill or a drug, which allows people to continue to eat the foods and lead lifestyles that led to that problem developing to begin with, um, rather than uh, addressing those root causes of diet and lifestyle that were a big part of it to begin with and were part of the root cause. Another reason why this not being a root cause treatment is a downside is I've talked before about there being a silver lining with migraines, which is that they can be seen as kind of a canary in the coal mine, um, alerting us when there are disturbances in the body that are harmful, um, that are stressing or overburdening our, our uh, brain and our body's homeostatic capacities. And if we listen to that signal and we adjust our behavior accordingly, then not only will we have fewer migraines, but we will also enjoy much better long-term health and well-being. For example, with Amy's comments that I read earlier, uh, it was not being able to get the drug immediately that led her to look for other possible solutions and stumble on the migraine miracle plan. And now she's fully on board with that and is not interested in drugs uh, anymore. And um, so oftentimes that's the issue is that the drugs keep us from looking into those most transformative uh, root cause treatments. And really that's the central message here, which is not that drugs are bad, but that, but that there are so many other effective treatments that are being completely ignored because we just have single-mindedly focused on that as the only tool. And so they get a disproportionate uh, amount of attention. It's as if we've forgotten that you can build houses out of something other than styrofoam, rubber bands, and glue, which leads people to miss out on uh, therapies and treatments that could be much more powerful and effective. So with all of those pros and cons in mind, uh, where do I, as a neurologist, uh, see the role of uh, Amovig and the other drugs in this class uh, that may follow? So one scenario I can see it being used is for those who are unwilling or unable to make uh, holistic diet and lifestyle changes that address root causes. Um, I think that's a re I think it's a reasonable option in that scenario. At the end of the day, uh, my main concern is reducing suffering. And in a perfect world, um, everybody would adopt the best course of treatment. But I'm a realist. Uh, uh, being in uh, the healthcare clinic for over a decade has taught me that. And I know that not everyone is ready to do, to do those sorts of things. So uh, this is a reasonable option in those situations. Um, now, as I said, I'm apprehensive about being an early adopter for things like this, and I think that history tells us that there's plenty of reason to be apprehensive. So I won't strongly advocate for it until it's been proven uh, in the real world. And so right now, I'm most apt to prescribe it for those uh, who ask for it and who are comfortable with the risks. And then for those who are, who are willing to adopt a holistic approach like the Migraine Miracle Plan, but who are in dire straits, um, particularly maybe in the very depths of rebound headaches and really need any extra boost they can get, I think it's a reasonable consideration in that scenario as well. In this instance, I'd favor using it as a short-term treatment, as a kind of temporary aid until rebound had been broken and the other changes had had enough time to take effect. As you probably know, my primary objective is to get people to migraine freedom without pills, mainly because the pills, the, the drugs, make it harder to get to migraine freedom. Um, but there are certainly scenarios where the drugs can actually work as an aid to getting you to that point. Um, ultimately, all that matters to me is trying to find the fastest and most effective approach to ending suffering from the beast. 
and I'm fine with using every available tool I have uh, to do that. So just as a final summation, um, on the plus side, uh, Amovig and the other drugs in this class I think are a significant scientific milestone, even if they're not a therapeutic breakthrough. breakthrough. And while this isn't a panacea, um, it could certainly improve the quality of life for some people, especially if it's used thoughtfully. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we were to divide all the things that we can do to strengthen our protection against the beast, a topic which I covered in the last uh, episode, this would be pretty far down on the list. Okay, so that concludes this discussion on uh, Amovig and the new class of CGRP uh, drugs. Uh, hopefully you found this helpful. Clearly these things aren't black and white. I think this discussion illustrates why medicine is referred to as an art. Uh, because it's messy and there are a lot of different considerations and seldom are things as cut and dry as we'd like them to be. So we are almost always operating without all the information we'd like and trying to deal uh, primarily with probabilities in a very imperfect system. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, please feel free to leave them inside of our Facebook group. And if you are wanting to adopt a root cause approach to migraines that to uh, slay the beast once and for all, um, head over to MindMigraineMiracle.com and click on our resources uh, link to see all of the things that we have available to help you get there. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Now it's time to go out and slay the beast. Thank you.